I'm going to close the doors. Okay. Do we need to close this one as well? Can you leave that one open for any sure. comers? Oh, all right. So two, four, five, <coughs> six, six, eleven of me is twelve. Okay. That's kind of what we can be doing. Okay. All right. Is this thing rolling now? Yes. Okay. All right. So, since that's rolling, we'll get the camera's rolling. We'll get going. Um, let's see. Sitting down at this end of the table is a little weird because I don't know if I have enough hairs to hold down the ones that are trying to escape. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it's going to look like on video. But anyway. What I wanted to do today, and what I thought was going to be just an informal get-together of those who are going to be in and around RITS. Okay, and it is, so that's fine with me. So thank you, Amy. <laughs> okay, the first thing I want, I, I had these two documents I put together, the RITS and Appeals, and the one just called RITS. We're sort of, this is going to be sort of the guide as we go through things. Um, just so I have a, a pathway through all of this material. What I wanted to do, though, is start out by talking to you about the difference between appeals and, and the petitions for extraordinary writ that we do. There's a really great case. It's 69 pages long from the California Supreme Court from 1995. And it's really worth the read because it has a lot of historic informa historical information. It's called Powers versus City of Richmond. It's, it's 1995 and it's 10 Cal 4th 85. And in this particular case, there was, a, there was someone who had sued the City of Richmond because he wanted to get some reports under the um, public Acts, and uh, it was the issue came down to whether there was an appeal or a writ. The court traced back to 1849 when California was having its debates, putting its constitution together, and um, it made the distinction. Following actually this example from Louisiana, made it the distinction between establishing powers of of a court, its jurisdiction. Which, and direct appeal, which covers like probate matters or land matters or um, death penalty cases. It's all expressed and set out in the California State Constitution. Um, but that's the only basis for direct appeals. Everything else we do is because we have a statute that allows us to do it. Okay. So, we have Section 395 in the Welfare and Institutions Code, which allows for appeals from final orders. But everything else, not from a final appeal, is by petition for extraordinary writ. And that's where you have the common writs like certiorari, writs of mandate, writs of prohibition, and what we do. Our statutes instruct when we can file writs, um, under what circumstances writs have to be filed. But writs are discretionary with the courts of appeals, so that's why we sometimes get back summary denials or summary denials. The courts don't always have to give us an opportunity for oral argument, and they don't have to go through a long discussion of the case facts and the case law that they're using because the writs are discretionary. The ones that we do among us is first the statutory, those that are compelled by statute. The first ones that we were always doing were those when the court makes an order referring a case for a selection and implementation hearing under 366.26, subdivision L. Any challenge at the hearing at which that order is made has to be brought by writ, okay, the petition for extraordinary writ. It's different from writ of mandate, um, but 
it's challenging all the orders. There's a case called Tabitha W. that compels all the issues that are presented at that particular hearing to be brought by the petition under 366.26L. If you don't bring it there, it's not allowed by direct appeal because there's only certain things which you have a constitutional right to appeal. That's why I cited to you that Powers case, which is a really interesting read. Um, so our writs um, come from the setting order, and I have some information for you about the 2-6 writs on the, uh, on the documents I passed out to you. So whenever that court sets a 2-6, failure to file a notice of intent to file a writ petition um, means that you're giving up all of the opportunity to challenge any orders that were made at the time that the writ is ordered to set. What I would like to do, though, is take, as we go along, any questions that you have that come up in any situation, we would like to, you know, we can ask them and discuss them. It will also take up time. So, okay. So there are any questions about, and that's what our little um, writ collective does. We just do the two six writs. Now that we have a senior two position within each office, um, I just want to invite you guys to recognize, those of you who do the senior twos, that it's going, your position is probably going to end up a pretty important position within your firms. Um, I know that there were some objections to pulling us out, um, but with the senior twos there, there's a whole lot of other kinds of writs which are being done. And um, now that there are five writ attorneys, we certainly are available to consult with our offices of origin, as you will, to talk with you about things without any fear of conflicts. Um, we also need to recognize that the senior two position, like I said, is going to end up evolving into a really important one because it's, you, there's always that one or two, or two people in the office that do read all the cases that come out, published and unpublished, um, that read the statutes as they are um, published and become part of the dependency case law. Um, and I think the senior two position is going to become exactly that, that go-to person within the office. Um, let's see. So, but there are other kinds of rich which the senior twos do. Okay. Whenever there's a 170.6 file, that has to be challenged by a writ, a petition for extraordinary writ. Um, the, Petition for Extraordinary Writ is compelled by Section 170.3, Subdivision D. Okay. Um, whenever there is a, a statutory challenge to be made, for instance, the Jeff M. kinds of cases, which I saw that um, Jason Steinberg had just successfully written, it's because there was a, a the court failed to set a disposition hearing within the six month time that it was supposed to do. So legal violations are also challenged. It wasn't a final decision in the case, but those types of decisions need to be challenged by writ as well. Um, and the court and the court there issued what's called the Palma Notice. I have the order that came out of that case um, the two-page thing from um, Division 5. What Palma notices are, and this is one thing they're going to get, it's considering issue, it's the issuance of a peremptory writ in the first instance. The case was Palma Fasteners, or Palma versus U.S. Fast, Industrial Fasteners. And basically what that is, is in certain situations where you have a... Court of Appeal, looking at something like the, the Jeff M. type of situation, and in where there is no doubt the law is in favor of the petitioner, there's really, with the facts, there's no other decision to be reached, they'll issue the Palma Notice, which, which is 
the Court of Appeals way of letting you know that we're going to rule in a certain way because it's legally required. So the parties should save themselves money, get together and talk this out because this is the order we're going to issue. If the court gets no response from anyone, because sometimes they do allow a response brief to be filed, they will simply reach their date and issue their order, which is what they happen to do in this particular case. So the court was compelled to set the hearing on the disposition in a timely manner. But I just wanted you to see what the orders for Palmer looked like. There are Is other that orders. Is that the in TG? Yes. Yeah, I probably would cross that out too. But that was it. That isn't that isn't the case. But I think this was actually called something else. But um, with that, I just wanted you to see what the type of order is that they will issue once a petition is filed. They will also issue alternative writs as well. You file your writ petition, the, the Court of Appeal at first read will see that there's some merit to it, and they'll issue an alternative writ. Okay, what that allows, and they'll also set a briefing schedule, which tells the parties that this looks pretty good to us, but we'll accept the res response, and here's a date by which to make a reply, and we'll set oral argument on it as well. So, um, that's the other kind of order that we see as well. So most of those writs that are petitions that are written will usually get that type of, of order from the court, giving you an opportunity to respond. It's usually the kind we get when we file the writs under 366.26L as well. Okay. So are there any questions so far about procedures or what we do? Okay, all right. So, um, let's see. What I wanted to do too is um, just is just direct you to um, the meaning of a writ. A writ is simply an order. That's all it is. Um, writ petitions generally are rarely granted. So that's why I didn't feel bad getting a denial of a writ that I wrote on the UCCJ case today. It made me cry inside, but outside, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. It's just, it's just Stevie's time, turn to cry. Um, I have a quick question. Yes, please. When, when would you ever uh, uh, file a, a writ of circuit to the Supreme Court? When? Okay. What, is, what is the use of it? When is that used? Um, that's used when you, okay, when you believe that there's an issue that the appellate court, the appellate courts throughout the state say really need to address. Okay. Um, you know, if, and you can probably imagine a lot of different situations, any, a lot of the uh, petitions for cert pretty much everything that we see in dependency, since most of the petitions that we write are petition for extraordinary writ and a fewer appeals. But, um, you know, sometimes, like, the rights, say, of a de facto parent to have a hearing um, or jurisdictional issues, when, you know, is a parent entitled to um, post reunification services, say, to have standing in a case to challenge whether a child should be removed from a relative's care. You know, you can, you can imagine all sorts of things, but they're usually things that haven't really been considered, issues that are really important statewide, and court rules set out the types of you know, <coughs> issues that the California Supreme Court may be issued in. It's to resolve conflicts between jurisdictions and be another reason to go to the California Supreme Court. Usually, just Precious more D and, uh, what was it? R T I T. Yeah, exactly. Because you had two just jurisdictions on the same issue, on the incorrigible. Unfortunately, we don't like what the Supreme Court did, but right. I think that's like a really good example because you had identical pa fact patterns with two jurisdictions <coughs> coming to different conclusions. Exactly. So you need a resolution from the Supreme. Right. So, other situations, um, that's for a writ of certiorari. 
Um, and again, those are completely, since it's a petition for extraordinary writ, one of those that's set out in the statute along with prohibition and mandate, um, it's discretionary with the Court of Appeal, whether it's the Supreme Court or an intermediary court, whether they're going to take on the issue or not. Um, and in one of the cases that I did cite, so they did, had some statistics on the civil cases generally, the Omaha Indemnity Company on page one of the uh, Ritz uh, Mr. site, but they had some, I, I didn't write it out there, but the information there was at least in civil cases where writs go up, 90% of them are summarily denied. You end up getting up to 94% of them are just, you know, another 4% are just denied outright. Um, you know, and you end up with maybe 3% are ever considered or either remanded or actually get reversal. So the chances of getting something reversed is fairly difficult. So when it does happen, it's kind of an exciting thing, at least on the civil side of things like we have, like we deal with here. Um, so again, that's why you should never feel too badly when you make your challenges. But challenges need to be made all the time. Um, you know, you're dealing with, <coughs> the way the California system works is we have the Supreme Court which resolves all issues. But each division of each district and between districts can all have their own view of law. And so it's not like when you're in the second district like we are, you can't cite to a, a fourth district or third district case because that's what California law is as well. So that's why the most important thing you can do every day, at least while you're here at the work, you don't expect anyone to do it on weekends, but you can at least read a case, really look at what the facts are in the case, because people go into court, doing trial court, and they get, see an idea like, um, you know, Elizabeth R. gets cited all the time. We read it, read about it in our transcripts. The case stand, the specific facts of the case were the kids were older, mother had mental health issues, and in that particular case, it was okay to continue beyond the 18-month date on the theory of 352A. But it's not applicable every time you get a case. Um, I mean, because you also have to consider best interests of kids. So it's not an automatic, we go past, past the 18 month. And when you read the statutes, just because you go past the 18 month because the parents are really close to that line where they'll really be able to meet the best interests of the children, of their kids, just because it goes out to the 24 month date, that's not a 2 on E. So it's just, you. that's just the outside limit that you can go to a hearing. So again, read the cases and statutes. It will help set up your writs. Could you say, go slow again, as to something you just said that I've never understood? Okay. okay. Could you explain the divisions? Right. And did you just say we could not cite? No. That's what I no. like. No, I, you, you, you if can. It's published, no, if it's yeah, published. if it's a published case, you can cite to it. Just because we're, you know, our district has eight divisions. Okay. The sixth is in the southern part of uh, Ventura County, or most of Ventura County. Um, division. One, which is San Francisco area, I think has five divisions. There's one division in, for three, which is the Sacramento area, five, which is the Fresno Kern County area. Um, there are four in San Diego, but you know, <coughs> the, the city of San Diego, County of San Diego, but also Imperial, Orange County is a different division. I think that's two. Riverside is, is one. Each one of those divisions can come up with their own view of, of the law. You can cite to any of them, and it's the California Supreme Court, which is the <coughs> arbiter of which law, which of all those views is the one that counts. Okay, but uh, that's why it's important to read cases. Yes. Um, so I've noticed for like 
at least the emergency writs that have been filed. Yeah. You know, um, when you're actually filing the writ petition, there's a, there's a lot of technicality, a lot of procedure, a lot of rules. Um, they want things like electronic bookmarking and, and right. hyperlinks and things like that. But then when people file oppositions, it, they're typically filing just like a letter. And, and that's what I'm seeing. Is that actually how we should be filing opposition? I, I don't mm. know. Okay. I haven't seen like a, like I haven't read like the mm. procedure guide for writs. I'm just kind of yeah. following the templates and kind of learning as I'm going. Right. Well, the, the court did set, did issue a, a procedure guide. I can make it available to people. I don't have it here. Um, one of the resources you can go to is courts.ca.gov. That's where I actually copied it from. That has a lot of information. Um, it's really good to use that site, too, even, even as a trial counsel, because you can put in the, the um, CK or DK or the CCJP number. And if there is an appeal that was taken or an opinion that was issued, it'll be on the site. And you can click on it, and you can find out what the early case history is because you don't say if you came into the case a little later, that information would be made available to you, and you can see what your client was like in the early days, you know, before they came back for the third time. <laughs> so those sites that was a joke. So those sites are good to go to, um, and also if <coughs> senior twos and others in your office should also have. Lexus Advanced site, at least, you know, the Senior Twos should have it on their computer. It's by subscription, so if you don't have it and need it, talk to our IT person, John, and he will get that to you. Um, because you need that, and you also need Adobe Pro. A lot of people have, we have the newer version 11, which is really easy to use. Because when you're on, when you file your writ petition, you save it as Adobe because that's what you need to file. When you want to highlight, it's really easy to use. You just hold, right click, um, block off the languages you want, and you hit Control B, and it all appears magically as uh, as a, nav in a navigation pane to the left side of the screen, and that meets the requirement for the Court of Appeal. So it's, it's not really hard to do. And, uh, and that's, that's really all the court wants. They just need to be able to have that navigation pane and be able to click on it and jump to the different headings within your brief. Okay. Um, I just want to talk about hot rips for a moment. Oh, but you didn't answer oh, my question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. My question was, is that is that okay? Like, oh, well, it, that, is that cool to just file letters in opposition like that? Well, that, that's what I was going to talk about in hot rips. Okay. Okay. Um, a lot of times we get the county will file, say if we're a 319 proceeding, the court may release a kid to a parent, one or the other. Um, the county doesn't like that, or the minor's attorney doesn't like that. Because really the ones, the real parties in interest are the ones, not the superior court, who are the parties that are filing writs, either defending the court or challenging its findings. Um, so they will file a more formal writ um, of mandate, okay, which looks a lot like the petition for extraordinary writ of mandate, which I made a copy of. <clears throat> that I did. It, I did a lot of redacting. Like I said, it was once I breathed too much of the solvent from the Sharpie, it was harder to remember what I was redacting. But I think by page six, I was in colors, which was, which was kind of fun. Um, so, the, I'm sorry. So, the, uh, let's say you get, this is what you'll get. With the so-called hot writs, a letter brief is accepted by the Court of Appeal here in the Second District. If they want a more formal response, then the court will ask for a more formal response. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we get something from the County Council, and we don't have a whole lot of time to respond, so they let us do these letter briefs. This letter brief that I had included, this happens to be for 319. Um, at, a, at the initial hearing, 
and um, it shows one effort I had made. Um, sometimes if you do nothing, the Court of Appeal may still deny the county's writ. Sometimes they want to see something like this letter looks, um, or they'll ask for more formal briefing. They'll issue a temporary stay, say, of, re of the um, trial court's decision, or or issue an affirmance of the trial court's decision to remove the child, but then they'll want to get more formal briefing and they'll ask you for that. They usually don't set oral argument, but <coughs> sometimes they will, but that's completely discretionary with the court. Steve, is but a yeah. hot writ the same as a request for a stay, is the same as a writ of mandate, is the same as an extraordinary writ? Okay. Or is that written here somewhere? No. Okay. The so-called hot writ is just an informal name given to the writ of mandate, filed in a circumstance where, you know, there's a quick response to what the court did, and you'll get something within a couple of days. Um, unfortunately for us, but I guess more fortunately for the county, because I have talked to them about it, they'll pull their county council out of court who will sit and have a day or two to file a declaration. They'll have one of the people from their appellate section sit and file the writ. They have another person to sit and review what was written. They'll have the person who assembles everything and makes sure it's all right, and they have the proof of service. Then they have um, Ms. Mesa, it's always the one that will then electronically file this with the court. Before there was electronic filing, they had someone to run these things down to the court of appeal. <coughs> and for us, it's like end of the day, it's five o'clock, coming back on the last bus. On a Friday. On a Friday. <laughs> yeah, it's because we usually get Or these. Christmas Eve. Yeah. Because right. 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 that's when we get these a lot. And then you're asking your attorney, by the way, over the weekend vacation, if you can get into it, um, could you file a declaration, you know, saying what, what happened? And it's or sit down and meet with me to talk about what was filed, or could you read the brief over the weekend? It, it, it's really a lot more pressure on us to get this stuff done. One good thing the Court of Appeal does recognize in the position that Ladle's in compared to what we need to do in representing our clients, the numbers of clients we have, and you know the turnaround time we really have to do this. I've talked to clerks there in the courts about this. Even better than that, the justices are aware because their research attorneys are also aware of, you know, the time restraints that we have to deal with a lot of these issues. So, knowing that, we can't be lazy about it, but they do cut us a little more slack than they do others. They know that they file, they, they know when they usually have a justice or two who's responsible for sitting and reviewing the so-called hot writs as they come in later. Don't use hot writs. Use okay. the legal name so we get Written, used to hearing okay, it. Okay, right. Writ, okay, the writs of mandate. Mandamus, okay. actually. Um, so ma mandate and mandamus are the same. Right, one's Latin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is mm -hmm. not an extraordinary writ. The extraordinary writ they're is all, the statutory writ? They're all, we have direct appeal. When we look at the case of Powers versus City of Richmond, okay. you may, for not, at, uh, 1995, 10 Cal, 4, um, 85. Okay. Um, those are direct writs, and everything else is, unless it's called an appeal, or you can uh, permit it to appeal by statute, it's not a constitutional right to appeal. Those are only the direct appeals that are set out in Article 4 of the California okay, State Constitution. Okay, state, state. California, I think, I think okay. it's California State, state Constitution. It as an emergency writ and a statutory. No, I want to use the legal language okay. because that's what, when right. we get they, the notices, so I'm asking you, okay. what's what, the difference okay. then between, when we have to file it, when we need to see... It's, they're all petitions for extraordinary writ, okay. all of them. All right. They're just different functions. Okay. Okay. And I set up somewhat of a definition of what, what they are um, in, let's see. Okay. I think, so we I have, mean, we yeah, know we when have, we have a hot so we writ. Have, yeah. Okay, so hot writ, hot writ is a writ of mandate, okay? okay. All right. It's, it's, it's a petition for extraordinary writ. It's, you'll see somewhere in here, I have, I have set out 
it appears in the Code of Civil Procedure, which is the writ of certiorari, the writ of mandamus, or writ of mandate. Okay. Mandamus is just the Latin, or a writ of prohibition. Okay. 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 Those are the main writs we're dealing with here. Okay. Mandate, you're asking the appellate court to compel the trial court, the inferior tribunal, to act in a certain way. Okay. A prohibition, just like it sounds, is to refrain from acting in a particular manner or to stop proceeding in, in acting in a particular way. Certiorari, it goes to the California Supreme Court, yeah. and you're asking that court to review a particular issue. Um, Yes. Can you also discuss supersedious? Yes, we'll get to that as well. Okay. Writs of supersedious are another always come up because what happens with writs of supersedious, <clears throat> there's also, there must be, according to a case called Inri Sheila B. Um, and others, there, it's because you want to halt proceedings, have a stay in the trial court while an appeal is pending, okay? So you'll see writs of supersedious. Because supersedious is a writ, the senior twos, and you can consult with your writ, writ attorneys from the uh, collective as you need to, but we, those are written, we have to have a writing in response to supersedious as well, while the appeals are pending. Could you Sometimes, give an example of when we might need that? I do. Yes. Great. Because I had one. So like uh, CLC filed a writ of supersedious. The court had dismissed the petition, and they had filed an appeal. And they had asked the court to sure. intervene um, and to stay the dismissal pending the resolution of the appeal. And the reason that they requested that was they were saying that if we're successful on appeal, we might be deprived of appellate rights because if you just dismiss the petition, we're not going to know where these people are. Yes. So we, in order to protect our appellate rights, we need you to just stay the proceedings until we get an order from the appellate. And it was supersedious versus a writ of mandate because the court had lost jurisdiction or because the appeal was pending? That's just the method that they chose. Yeah. Could they have also done a writ, an extraordinary writ of men? Damus? Well, I think, they would, I think so. You know, it's because on the dismissal of a petition, you have a final order. The case is over. So the court is saying, I'm giving up jurisdiction. Right. The trial court is. So you're asking the appellate court to stay whatever findings the trial court made through supersedious, and you're appealing. What does sometimes happen, though, is that when an opposition is filed to the writ of supersedious, the Court of Appeal, the same division, is going to have your opposition. They're going to look at both. They may consider the appeal find and dismiss the appeal, okay, because you've answered sure. the, quest sure. the legal question in your opposition, sure. and which is sufficient. Okay. So if they want to have an order stayed that isn't a final order, where the court still has jurisdiction, they request a stay. Correct. But if it's shut down, closed out, everybody can go off to Nevada or whatever, right of supersedious. <clears throat> right. Okay. 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 Yeah, go ahead. Well, the last, without the last sentence, it was, it was good. Well, okay, yeah, that's why I got confused at yeah. the end there, because I'm yeah. not sure that that was right. without the last entirely sentence. right at the end. Yeah. That they can well, move? Well, no, because I, I think <laughs> with a writ of supersedious, very often they're requesting a stay under either circumstance, because if the jurisdiction was dismissed, they're going to request the state so that they, during that pendency, can file the writ of supersedious. But even if there's ongoing jurisdiction, they're asking for the stay, because essentially with a writ of supersedious, you have to be able to establish that there's irreparable harm that's going to be done. And in order to establish that, you better have asked for that stay at the outset. Having filed a writ of supersedious of our own right, not just responding to one, I know that if we as Latos want to file one, then your trial attorney needs to ask for that stay at the trial court level. Otherwise, you have not established that you've attempted all other um, alternative remedies available to immediately secure that um, sort of press pause on the proceedings, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Okay. okay. And you also need the stay, need to request it 
pretty much in all circumstances, because you want the court of appeal not to allow the trial court to do anything other than ensure the safety and stability of the minor. You don't want any other issues resolved because, in effect, that would allow the case that's before the appellate court to become moot. So in order to have your questions answered, you need to ask for the stay. Stays require a showing of good cause. Good cause means that these issues that are subject of the appeal may be disturbed by actions of the inferior tribunal if the appellate court doesn't stop any further action on them. Okay, so you're, by seeking a stay, you're protecting your appellate rights. Yes. Can I say something? Um, Amy Meyer actually wrote three or four uh, opposition letters to writs of supersedious. Uh, they're three of the best letters I've ever read. In turn, I, I don't mean to put you on blast. I, I didn't <laughs> tell her I was going to say this in advance, but if you want a really good template, um, she has three, at least three, very good examples that I've read. There are two requirements in a writ of supersedious, the second of which is why we almost never file writs of su supersedious ourselves. It's almost always the county or minors council. Um, the first one is that uh, <clears throat> the appeal is likely to be meritorious, and the second is that uh, the, I'm trying to remember the language, but the granting of the stay, uh, or not granting the stay, uh, the harm that is issued from not granting the stay is outweighed by granting the stay. Or by, by not, uh, you, you hear yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. It's really hard to explain. It's like, if the court doesn't yeah. grant the stay, basically, First of all, it'll affect the appellate. Leaving it alone too. is going to fuck things up bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Danger, 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 danger. It's going to be dangerous to right. children. And, 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 the way, yeah. and the way that's Danger, usually, danger to children. Right. We can't that's the way it's usually phrased, which is why we can never really yeah. make that argument, because yeah. we're the danger. Yeah. <laughs> Will Robinson. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Could you make that available? We certainly, in our law firm, you can, you know, redact any of the information as to the client. But I would love it. I, I have my own, but she, I think, would be better, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, are there any questions on what we've discussed so far? Oh. <laughs> yes. Seriously. Okay. Are you, you know, okay. Yeah, th this is why most people like to go to court. <laughs> Um, this is why we had writ attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> just take yeah. care of it. Huh? Yeah, we, we've had the experience of court and now just want a place to be and just think of the law. Ponder. Um, and ponder. Okay. And that brings me back to what, what one theme is of this, aside from reading cases. Read the statutes. It will help you in court immensely. It'll help you understand that there is really a theme to juvenile dependency. There is a flow to the work um, that it becomes a complicated administrative law issue, you know, with the independency. It'll help you know when a new judge is going off track. It'll keep you the focus of argument because when I, st I know from my own experience, when I started doing writs all the time and I got a few people reversed, um, you go back into their court and they will, the judges will listen to what you have to say more than just relying on county counsel. It's actually the truth. If you go in and actually know the case, the distinction between JE from, from November of 2016 where you're allowed to go beyond the 18 month date and you understand the difference between that and the 352A continuance of Elizabeth R. and can explain it to the court, well, and you're right. The courts will start relying on you. That's the only way they pay attention to parents' attorneys. It truly is, because they have a view of what parents' attorneys are, and with the exception of a few, you know, a few really intellectual types of judges that we do have here, the rest are just looking for practical decisions and to move on to the next case. So it really behooves you to read the statute, understand what a substantial risk of detriment is, 
when the burden is on the department to provide reasonable services, when the burden is upon the parent to show that there is no substantial risk to the child if returned home, like you know, bypass types of things. Um, by knowing the distinctions and the cases, you're really going to put yourself in a better position than just the five minute interview, running into court, saying hi to your friends in the ante room, you know, grabbing some coffee and you know, running into court because they're calling your next case of 15 on the calendar. If you could, it's like for baseball or sports, when you slow the game down in your head, you're going to be much better off when you go into court. You really will, especially when you're when you do become the focus, and you're the reliable source of information for the <coughs> bench officer. So, read cases, read statutes carefully, distinguish them, and you'll be happier inside. <laughs> it's it's kind of like the joy of tidiness. Great show. Great show. I love that. I binge watched all of it. So. Anyway, um, additionally, so we have writs of mandate, which we initiate. We have writs of prohibition. Or, and writs of prohibition really always seem to get named along with writs of mandate and or prohibition. Put them together, you can't go wrong. You no longer have to worry about writs of um, vorbis quorum or vorbis no nobis. Thank well, that's a relief. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, th those have pretty much been absorbed in all Jessica's of the Jessica's getting excited now. One yeah. more? <laughs> you know, you know, if you want to say mandamus instead of mandate, you know, go ahead if it reminds you of the old days, but it's really not necessary any longer. Okay. Again, any questions so far? Okay, so how many are always in trial court? Who, who's in the room who's just doing trial? You know, uh, okay. And the rest of you are all writing writs? Okay. Or letter briefs. Yeah, okay, or letter briefs. Um, okay. Um, Joiners are my new favorite. <laughs> yes, I know. Those, those, yeah, you can also join in, that's okay. Um, also, what's really, what you need to know is when you do write your writs of mandate, especially, Glen C, even though Glen C st stands for the proposition that you can't find any issues, okay, it also has language in there as to, to remind people what's required for the writ of mandate. Um, you want to have a clear statement of the facts. You want to identify <clears throat> clearly what the issues are and have legal discussions citing to points and authorities. You have to identify, when you write the facts, you have to refer to the clerk's transcript, the CT and a page number. You have to refer to the reporter's transcript with RT and a page number. When you first, if you're going to file a writ of mandate in this example that I have for you with all the redactions, um, and you present that to the court, you may not have a reporter's transcript yet. So make certain, there is a form, I think each office has one, um, or the court has one where you can present it to the court reporter. If you can't get the court to order the reporter's transcript for you, so the court pays for it, which they rarely will do. Ladle, I've never known Ladle not to pay for a transcript. So get the form to the reporter. The reporter will prepare, will give you the amount of money it's going to cost because they can tell the number of pages. Okay, and they will give you an original and a copy. Okay, once once they get your check, and. Uh, we get the original. So on the form, make sure that Ladle gets the original, because the original is what we end up filing with the Court of Appeal. Okay? It becomes less important now with, um, with uh, true filing. Um, but they, we get the original and the copy. All other copies, if people want them, under the government code, there's a section, have to be paid for. So. I know that the courts, if we get the original and we get a copy, if we're asking for a reporter's transcript, 
will say, well, we want a copy for the court. The court has to buy one from the reporter. The government statute is in there to make sure that the reporters get paid for the work they do and the copies that they make for everybody. Okay. Do you know the code section? Um, it's the code, no, not offhand. The code section is usually printed on the reporter's transcript. It's, you know, usually at the bottom. Um, and that's to remind everyone, you got to pay for the work we do. Okay. So if the court wants a copy, they pay for it. If somebody else wants to examine your copy, you can make it available for examination. But if any other party, including us, if the county files reporters' transcripts, we're not supposed to share it, and we're supposed to have to buy it. I know that the county will sometimes make copies of everything. I don't know if it's because they paid the reporter for it or it comes out of some county funds for it. But um, we don't. We can let people see it, but we don't have to buy other people copies. Okay, is that an exciting thing to know? As a if you're going to trial tomorrow morning, probably not. But when you're by yourself, <laughs> it's exciting. So. <laughs> um, Hello, Steve. Yes. Once your filing, does it kind of circumvent that? Because when you file it, then like say we were filing a writ and we mm -hmm. asked for the original transcript, we right. file it through true filing. <clears throat> that copy then gets technically sent out to everybody else through true well, filing. You file the you file the reporter's transcript usually separately. That's why. You file either, when you're filing a writ of mandate, if you get an early copy of the reporter's transcript, you, you can file that with the court. You can, under true filing, you can just file, okay? There's a serve and file option, and then there's just a file option. You can just file it, and it'll only go to the court, okay? When you do the file and serve and attach your exhibits, you know, it can go to everyone. Sometimes you have to just, um, you know, and we'll get to that. I'll get to that. Um, but you, I've, I've done a writ before where I have filed the reporter's transcript separately, and there were complaints, um, but nothing ever came of it because I had a copy available if anyone wanted to come to the office and look at it. And that's all that's required. Okay that they don't get their own unless they pay for it. Um, exhibits sometimes become a problem for us when we're attaching it to our writs of mandate because there might be a lot of them. Um, you can break them up into smaller packets. I know Amy had to do that because true filing still, the computer service only takes so many pages at a time. Um, and so she just broke it up sent it to them in little packets, and everybody was happy with it. You can still file and serve them with the court with a smaller packet, and everyone will get their own exhibit list. Exhibits. And you divide it up, like, do you do like, like exhibit A, exhibit B, whatever, or just mm -hmm. well, minute orders, whatever? How you well, you can see what I did. I usually will, okay, if, if you want to do a packet of minute orders, mm -hmm. it's best to identify each minute order, because you may refer to it in a footnote as Exhibit 1 or Exhibit 2, mm -hmm. 3. When you're serving it like that, um, you know, mostly I've seen them just group it together and they'll just refer to, you know, Exhibit 1 in the minute order date, figuring that somebody can figure out how to get to the minute order you want to. So, right? and I believe the exhibits, you have to do a separate table of contents. They all need to be date stamped. Yeah. yeah. So that's how they're submitted. Yeah. And the other thing, um, Adobe 11 will allow you to do bait stamped. There's a feature for it. Okay, you, um, I, I can show anyone how to do it. Um, I think that um, you know Frank figured it out by himself, and so did Nicole, and you so did the, Shannon, and sh so did Christina. And you need the paid version, yeah. though. You can't use yeah. just any trial copy. Yeah. Did you say you need the paid version of version? Adobe? Uh, yeah. The Adobe Pro. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's a subscription service and I've not known anyone not to be, have it put onto their um, computer, because it's yeah. by computer. Well, he's, he's ordered a dozen subscriptions, but, and they've been approved, but John doesn't know when they're coming and there's none available, mm -hmm. so. Okay. 
always use one of ours. Yes. So, I mean, in, in each office, I mean, the senior twos are going to need it. They're going to need the subscription. The directors probably will want it. And the supervisor, you know, so, you know, somebody's on vacation, you know, some person who's trained will, you know, will want to have it on their computer because it's what by computer subscription service. So there should be someone in your office who has it. You, can, you, know, you can use it. Okay, especially if it's a laptop, it'll be easy to get on. It doesn't require a passcode. It's just there, so you can use it. Um, let's see. All right. So, um, so like I said, Glen C is usually the no issues letter. It, it's similar to criminal appeals. There's the Wendy briefs. Um, in appeals, there's Phoenix H. That that does the same thing. And um, but all these. And then I gave you two other cases, which are, are good to know about. That's Melinda K. and Inray TG, which also cites another case, Inray SB. Those were cases where you had a couple of parents. One, the court found <coughs> that additional reunification services would be given. So you move on, say, from the 6 month to the 12, or from the 12 to the 18. But a parent complains that they didn't get reasonable services from the department, even though they got the additional time for reunification. To challenge the finding of reasonable services, you have to do it by way of writ. Okay, so again, a petition for extraordinary writ is the way to go. These cases explain that because there's no final judgment, there's no, there's no negative finding made against the parent because they get additional FR. If you want to challenge whether the services were reasonable, you have to do so by way of writ petition. You know, at the t so you're not going to file an appeal because there's no final judgment, but you need a writ. And again, writs, writs have the same effect. They look like appeals when you put them all together, but you need to consider exactly what it is that you're challenging. Um, let's see. Is anything else about petitions for extraordinary writ which you think that you need to know or seems confusing? I had a question about the formatting. Okay. The formatting guidelines that I got from um, Jessica indicate that you are to use no less than one and a half spacing. But on the trial briefs, it seems irrelevant that you can just use whatever. Is that true? Um, no. You are supposed to use at least um, one and a half spacing between the lines. Most people just do double spacing. You're also not supposed to use Times New Roman anymore. That was just made part of a rule. And yeah. because they, the Court of Appeal, who, whose ever eyes were needing something other than Times New Roman, got a rule passed. So now you can use, you can use Book Antigua. That's a lovely one. You can use um, Calibri. It's fun to say, and it looks real cool. Um, you don't want to. You want to use Calibri body and not Calibri light. You know, the same way on a really hot day, you don't want Bud Light because it makes you feel less than. So use Calibri body. So, but this is a letter brief. That's a letter brief. And it's single space. Yeah, it's supposed. To, but that was before the space and a half okay. requirement. All right. It's just easier to read. Because what you have at the okay, I get you, Jason. Hang on. Because what you have is, um, you know, the research attorneys at the court of appeal sit at cubicles, and they have they have better fluorescent lights attached to their desks, you know, than just the overhead lighting that so many of us have to use in the offices. Um, but they're just sitting there, literally going page by page by page. So just graduating from Yale or Harvard or Princeton doesn't necessarily guarantee you a really fancy office and desk. <laughs> but, but most of the people who work at the Court of Appeal are really super bright. They're, I've met a few at conferences, and they're really nice folks. And they've been doing this a while. And you know they end up writing the preliminary briefs for the justices who then meet with them. Um, they have their writ days. They have appeal days. And um, they conference, and they, 
that the writs are pretty much put together by the research attorneys, and in their conference, you know, changes are made, but the writs are put together. So by the time oral argument comes, usually in our writs of mandate that we file or even appeals, you know, the briefs are pretty much written. The times they're not is when you have, you know, if you go to the Court of Appeal, it's, it's kind of a lot of fun. It's nice wood paneling in their courtroom. But, you know, when you're talking about whether the California mailbox rule applies to an oil distribution contract between ExxonMobil and Occidental Petroleum, they, you know, and you come, they might not have the, the opinion written because, you know, they're there with the line of attorneys from the offices, the major offices with the notebooks on their laps, taking notes of what the conversations are between the justices and the... Um, attorneys and there's just it's just really fun to watch so um, we don't have to do that writing our writs of mandate or sending our letter briefs out in response to them um, a lot of times um, you know if, um, Jason you were going to ask a question about something I no. heard your voice come up no I think made a noise okay all you right I think you were saying that the letters are informal. Yeah, the letters, I, the, if you look at letters from county council, miners council, and the letters we've written as well, um, we've never seen a letter be rejected from the Court of Appeal yeah. because mm -hmm. they use Times New Roman. They are filed under letter brief and true filing, but yeah. uh, they're essentially just letters. So, And they're, they're meant to be informal, which is why um, to answer a question you had earlier about opposition letters versus opposition briefs. Right. Um, I found personally, and many of you probably have as well, that the Court of Appeal for these, sorry, hot writs, or writs of manibus, they come back really quick, like within 48 hours usually. And if we don't respond within that time, they make a, a decision without ever hearing from us or we file something after they've already had like an interim decision, like a, they'll, they'll grant a stay. Um, <coughs> And so we want to get something out as quickly as possible, you, in hopefully the same day, which is why when I do it, and I don't know the rule if you were asking for a specific rule of court, I, file the, I filed the opposition letter, but as a remedy, I, I'd ask for um, a denial of the stay or as an alternative, uh, um, an opportunity to file an opposition brief or a briefing schedule. Well, my next yeah. question is following up on that is, we had one just come down last week, so we filed the letter, but the letter was pretty on point. So the appellate court um, denied partial stay of what the department wanted, but granted partial. So they now, all full exhibits, full everything. So my question is, if we give them our all in a quasi-letter brief, um, why why would we repeat it all over again in an opposition? What more could we do? What, yeah, what more can we do? Should you do something like that? I mean, we gave it our all in the more informal way, and we got half a victory, half a not. We still got to challenge it, but there's, what else can we say? We put it all in there. Personally, but has anyone ever had the Court of Appeal respond and say file a... So I have. I have. You have? Yeah. That was the yeah. first. Yeah. I have. I've always won. Uh, after the opposition letter, they'll deny it. But uh, to answer your question directly, I think there usually is more to say. In an opposition letter, we don't really cite a lot of law. I mean, there's those baseline laws we that... Uh, well, we have But with a good amount of legal research, there's, there's usually something more you could cite. Um, in, in my experience, a lot of the time, we would file um, declarations uh, and attach them. Uh, and this is before any of us, including the uh, um, county or, or miners council, filed the actual reporter's transcripts. So all, all they're relying on at that point are just affidavits from, um, from the attorneys in the case. So you know, once you have a more concrete idea of what happened at the hearing, yeah, it's definitely possible. In your particular case where you really felt like you did everything you could, well then, then maybe you did. I don't know. I mean, just for reference, the courts, California courts website under their practices and procedures has a whole 
section about opposing a writ by way of either a preliminary opposition letter right. and what that should consist of and right. how informal and limited it's supposed to be in the law and what they really want to hear versus what a formal opposition is going to look like if they request a response. You may then be attaching a declaration from your trial counsel. You may then be you know, going into much greater detail on the facts and the law analysis, legal analysis that you didn't have the opportunity or time to get into. Because when you're filing that preliminary letter opposition, it might be that like, well, this isn't the appropriate legal remedy. And, and then they say, okay, well, we're granting the stay and now we want to hear on like the actual meat of the merits of this writ, at which point that's what I understand the formal opposition to then right. be requesting from you. And right. when, when you read the case of Glenn C., what the practice was is that attorneys representing a parent would turn in these, you know, two and a half, three page letters. They'd cite to a couple of cases, no real workup of the facts of the case. And the court was recognizing that, you know, unlike appeals, where they have a lot of time to read and think about what's going on. They have the whole of the transcripts. We don't always have that with petitions for extraordinary writ. So if, they, if the Court of Appeal is looking at our letter briefs and looking at a really somewhat incomplete writ of mandamus that, we're, that we need to reply to, the court may want to stretch the issue out a little bit. So it, puts the brakes on and asks for more information because it wants to give that particular issue better treatment. Okay. okay. You really have the right. Yeah. So, so, the yeah. so, um, so that'll give them a chance. Okay. Also, the one last thing you need to recognize between the courts, there's no such thing as horizontal stare decisis. So you can take that with you back to court or to your desk. There is a horizontal ball, but there's no horizontal side. And if you guys were, didn't get the handouts, they're all up here, and there is a really big one that some of you may have missed, so make sure you guys follow the handouts. Thank you. 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 Thank you.